And so, you know, then it's like you get to your second year and your third years, you know, typically that's when then you're going to be doing less class and more lab work. And then you're doing more so on your own. Or you Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Food Grads podcast with me, Veronica Hislop. And we have a fantastic guest for you today. We are speaking with AJ Taylor, a scientist at McCormick Fauna. They are a flavor company that develops and manufactures flavors in a variety of categories. McCormick actually puts out once a year a flavor forecast report, which is this comprehensive report that looks at upcoming flavor trends. But today we're going to be focusing on AJ and his experience as a graduate student. AJ graduated with a PhD in food science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where his research focused on understanding the physiochemical and microbiological aspects of cocoa bean fermentation cacao bean fermentation, I should say. And as someone who's doing a PhD, I know that this is not an easy feat. So today we're going to talk about the process of getting into graduate school, what it's like actually being in graduate school, and that journey outwards of leaving the grad school life and getting a full-time job. AJ is an open book, and that makes it really easy to talk to him about his grad school experience, making it the perfect episode to listen to if you're thinking about grad school. Let's get into this interview with AJ. So my name is AJ Taylor. Uh, I'm 29 years old. Uh, I live in Illinois in and of itself. I just started with uh, McCormick and Company at the Fona location, which was um, kind of, they just bought Fona about three or four years ago overall, but I work in uh, the kind of the flavor solutions area. And so my title is scientist to innovation is what it's called. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. You're already at number two and you just got started. <laughs> I know it's great. <laughs> it was a, the, well, so, it, you know, super funny story in, in this, but I originally had applied for a principal scientist because I don't know if, you know, same with you, like when I was applying for things, I had no idea what titles honestly kind of meant, if that makes sense. Like here, you're a senior scientist, but here you're a scientist for, but here you're an associate. Like it yeah. was just, it was weird. And so I, I saw principal scientist, and I was like reading through and I was like, you yeah, know, it's, it's a little bit out of my experience range, but I really liked the position and the idea behind it. And so I was just like, hey, I might as well uh, try it out. And, and luckily that was the one that gave me an interview and gave me a job. So I was happy with that. Perfect. Well, well, we'll we'll go into that a little bit later. Yes, we'll definitely. start with more of the graduate, just to set the groundwork for everyone, because yeah. um, you did PhD, you did a lot of chocolate research. Um, yes. So I I know a little bit about it from the fat crystallization side, but I think you're you're in another realm of the chocolate. So let's talk graduate school. Let's talk what you did and talk about where you went and how that went for you. Sure. So I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Uh, originally, it was for a master's. We were working on phylogenetic clades for listeria monocytogenes and biochemical research that I no longer honestly want to think about in the kindest way possible. Um, but we got to a point where the professor I was working with was a new professor. Um, and so we were not able to acquire funding to transition that master's into a PhD. And also he needed to graduate people because it counts towards his um, uh, like tenure and everything else, no matter if that makes sense. And so there was just no particular way with that professor to continue on from a master's into a PhD. So I graduated with my uh, master's and then went into a PhD with a different advisor, but still at the same university. And that was with uh, Dr. Nikki Angaseth, who's the department head for the food science human nutrition uh, department down there. And we basically originally, because of my microbiology background, wanted to look at fermentation aspects of theobroma cacao. Because for those that are just not aware, cacao is actually a fermented product. And so you have these cacao pods, they'll be opened up. There's basically these uh, cacao beans inside of them. And then surrounding them is this like white pulp. And that white pulp is a very sugary, sweet, sticky substance that can easily be fermented because there's just a huge amount of sugar content in there. And uh, obviously yeast and bacteria happen to love that, right? And so the yeast come along and they'll ferment the sugars into alcohol and carbohydrate, you know, or sorry, um, carbon dioxide and water and all that other stuff and start making volatile organic compounds. And then you'll get lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria. And so we wanted to build out this concept of, could you be able to relate the bacteria, uh, or there's not just the bacteria, but the microbes inside of the cacao that were fermenting this, and they're all spontaneous cacao fermentations. They're not starter cultures typically for the cacao industry. Could you relate those microbes to different flavors or different particular um, 
flavors or volatile organic compounds that could be produced later on. So could you take the same cacao and then ferment it with, you know, this type of bacteria and this type of yeast and this one with this type of yeast and this type of bacteria? And could you get two different flavors, even though it's the same cacao, same location, same area, same climate, you know what I mean? Like basically everything else being the same, but the only thing was the microbes being the difference. And, um, we really built out this project. I, I spent about a year crafting it out. We were sending, you know, trying to figure out collaborations and where we wanted to host it, who would be able to work, you know, with us because we needed to make sure that that, that cacao was not going to be used to um, go to commercial, for example. We needed to design wooden boxes. You know, it was a whole thing, right? Like we had to sit down and craft out every single little bit of this. And uh, we go to Ecuador in January of 2020 for a study abroad that we were leading, uh, myself and my advisor. And we went there for about, uh, I think it was like 14 days or so. Um, we went around and talked with some collaborators at the same time while also leading the study abroad. And we got, you know, a bunch of yeses, be super happy, would love to work on that, yada, yada. We work with the university down there. We come back, we start applying for grants and funding. We're able to acquire like $12,000 in funding to come back at a summer and spend like a couple months basically in Ecuador. And then March, 2020 happens and everything shuts down. Right. And um, it was this very unfortunate, just like I'm assuming with every other PhD and or graduate student that was in COVID that was like, well, what do I do? Um, and, you know, especially for my project, not to, to, you know, go too much on the fiddle, but basically like ours was all international based. Everything that we had to do had to be done in country. There was no particular way that we could be able to acquire cacao pods and ferment them in the lab. We tried, you know, you have to apply for a permit. The permit takes a couple months basically to be able to get. You go through the permit, then you can, you know, now you have to buy the cacao pods. Well, at the same time, there was a chocolate shortage because COVID was happening at the exact same time. So there was no extra quote unquote cacao pods to be able to be purchased in the first place. We've tried to work with the universities down there to say, hey, could you be able to even get like 10 just so that we can try a trial run or something like that? Um, they were able to acquire said 10. They shipped it out to us. It took 10 days. We opened up the box and they're all rotting inside. And we're like, oh my gosh. that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it, it was a, it was a very harrowing and, and I would honestly will say depressing experience because it was just, you know, I would meet with my advisor, we would go over some things, it would take about 10-15 minutes, I'd log off for the day, and I couldn't really continue or push forward more, right? And it was just because, you know, my project wasn't um, based off of doing something in the lab, it was like, I needed to be in farms, I needed to be working with farmers, we needed to do these mm. things. And so it was really difficult to, to do that. So we got to, I think my third year of my PhD, it's about a year and a half overall, like later, and um, we were like starting off and I had, you know, no data, no papers, no, nothing kind of like working. I had a systematic review and meta-analysis I was working on. But other than that, I really didn't have anything else. And I, I went to my advisor and I was like, I'm going to be honest, we've got to move on or I'm, I've got to leave grad school because it was just, it was getting to a point where it was just no longer sustainable for myself and for, you know, my family situation itself. It was getting to like, this is getting kind of in a bad area. So we finally just decided, okay, that August, we're going to spend from August to December, we're going to completely revamp the entire project. We're going to come up with a brand new project and come up with a brand new idea. And we're just going to start doing something. And it doesn't matter necessarily what we're doing. We're just going to just start and get something. And maybe from there, the the train will, you know, leave the station basically, and, and something will hurt, happen and, the, you know, something like that. So, we started working on a, a project of brewing cacao tea uh, or brewing theobroma cacao as a tea and seeing the physical chemical parameters behind that. So pH, titratable acidity, total phenolics, uh, antioxidants, whole bunch of different chemical things that we were basically measuring for different brewing methodologies of cacao. So we would hot brew, cold brew, with shells, without shells. Um, different roasting parameters that we would try to see if that influenced the, the resulting tea itself. And then we, you know, we would run nothing published basically but internal sensory you know standard okay we like this one this one's not so good mm -hmm. uh, this one tastes different than this one tastes lighter or whatever um yeah. but you know we, we would just do that and then as we were thinking about this um we got to like december i was like if you know if this is just a tea if i take a a, a bunch of microbes <laughs> called a scoby and throw it in there with some sugar could i make it into a kombucha basically and um 
that was pretty much the second project that we worked on was, you know, we, we basically uh, finally came up with a, a good methodology for brewing cathedral of cacao. And then we turned it into um, a kombucha by, you know, putting a, a SCOBY in there and then looking at how that affected in different quantities of the SCOBY, the different amounts of the sugar, different amounts of what we call the mother liquid, which is the housing unit for where the SCOBY is being held. There's like this liquid that's like a vinegar in there. And so you would typically add like 10 to 15 milliliters of that into a normal kombucha brewing process to get it ready for the SCOBY. So we tried different levels of the mother liquid to see, could that be, you know, also influencing it as well. And then we tried different amounts of cacao, five grams, 10 grams, 20 grams, 50 grams, and seeing how does that affect the various physical chemical properties afterwards. And then that led into the third project, which was I wanted to get into e-sensing and, and using NIR and hyperspectral imaging basically to, to develop qualities of cacao or to develop predictive models for qualities of cacao, I should say. And uh, we were able to finally go back into Ecuador because COVID kind of, you know, lifted in restrictions mm -hmm. and everything. And so January 2022, uh, we went back to Ecuador for the second time for our study abroad. And then I basically stayed there for like a month and a half later uh, than everybody else. So we would, you know, fly in, everybody else left, I would stay. And then we went to different cities in Ecuador to collect cacao samples to bring them back. And then we had the cultivars. We knew where they were from. We knew what type of cacao that they were. We knew the roasting parameters. We knew basically everything that we could possible about it. And then we brought it home and then looked at it under uh, using NIR as the main way and then did a bunch of physical chemical properties, you know, fat, protein, moisture, uh, fermentation quality, like all sorts of like 11 different parameters that were a pain in the booty. Um, and then did multivariate statistics and, um, you know, multivariate statistics stuff. So that was fun. Um, wow. so we, yeah, it was, it was a blast. It was fun. Uh, I'm so glad and and happy that it is over with us <laughs> <It was laughs> eight years of grad school in total. So, you know, it was I, very, I understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand, but it's amazing hearing i honestly when i asked you about your research i was expecting here's my three projects here's what i did i got in i got out like that's yep. i know that's not typical but at the same time right. that's what you kind of expect when you hear someone's answer yep. but hearing how your first project didn't really pan out from covid and then all that reminded me of my own research because right. i had to scrap my whole first project because it was not reproducible and yeah. i just like i can't handle this but um that's amazing that you were when you started with this project originally pre-COVID, did you know that you were going to be traveling? Like, was that something you had planned oh, yeah. to do when you did to grad school? Yeah. So what the idea was is we wanted to go to these farms and then for about a month at a time. So there was different there was different projects that we had for that. So one of them is we wanted to look and see how does the microbial community change over time at one particular place in one particular area over time so could we go like january um i think it was like september and then january again and we would basically look at the microbes and sequence the microbes in one set of wooden boxes that were being fermented of cacao because when they're using these wooden boxes they're using them over and over and over and over and over again so we wanted to say hey if you start with a clean brand new box and you ferment cacao and you know you do it in six months you do it 12 months you do it in 18 months what is the longitudinal way that the microbes change over time if they do change over time versus something that's like it's been there for you know years and years and years and they just use the same ones over and over and over again right um another one was like i said before we wanted to try to use specific microbes to say okay if we do yeast A with lactic acid bacteria A with acetic acid bacteria A and then yeast B, LAB, B, you know, acetic acid B and then C, C, C. And then can we do A, A, B, A, A, C, B, A, you know what I mean? It's just like just doing a, a, a right. And so it would be a lot of fun because it was going to be different fermentations and different aspects behind it. And then we would take it and we would make it all into chocolate. We would roast them all the same way, dry them out the same way, mill it the same way, ferment it, or uh, uh, sorry, uh, temper it the same way. Every, basically everything else, as much as we possibly could, would be the exact same thing, except that it would just be the microbes would be different. And that was the coolest thing behind it because nobody, well, not 
I shouldn't say nobody. It was, it was very, it's very difficult to link microbes to flavor changes in chocolate because you go through fermentation, drying, roasting, conching, milling, uh, you know, if you add anything in sugar content, different amounts of it, vanilla, the caramel, like, you know, different flavors, basically into tempering. It's like, there's eight other steps that you have to go through to try to see there's a chocolate difference change, right. And in, in, in quality and everything. And so we really, we built out this really cool system that I thought was so cool of could, you know, you could truly answer the question of does the different types of fermentation here affect here, or could you take something that is basically a lower quality cacao, but ferment it with specific microbes to make it taste as though it is a higher quality cacao basically, or vice versa. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of traveling, but again, it just, it didn't pan out. And we just got to a point that was like, it is what it is. And, and we had to move on from there. Yeah. With, for, for a lot of people who are going into grad school, I know, or thinking about grad school, I should say, it's it's a lot of confusion about how the process actually happens. Because you just told me about this, this set of experiments that you created. Was this when you're applying to grad school, you spoke to an advisor and you had the project set for you? Or was it something that you came up with after you got into grad school? Because I think that can be confusing for a lot of people. It's like, well, what do I do when I get signed up? Like, how wh what's my project? How do we even start it? So how was that process for you? Yeah. So, I mean, being at UIUC, I've seen um, for like eight years overall, I've seen a lot of different grad students that have kind of come through. And the biggest thing I could say is it is extremely dependent on your advisor. Some advisors are very much hands-on. They, they will be with you in the lab. They will walk you through different things. They will make sure that you're doing X, Y, or Z thing, right? Um, some advisors are much more hand-off. They will hands-off where they'll say, you know, if you come up to them and say, oh yeah, I think we should do the antioxidant. They'll be like, cool. Um, what's the methodology you're using? And you'll be like, uh, I don't know. And they're like, cool, go to the literature, find out, try some different methodologies and see what you need to do. Like, and, and, and basically, you know, it'd be, it's, it's much more on you and every single person is a little bit different. Like when I was coming into my master's, I remember talking with my advisor at the time and he said that there was going to be two projects that we'd probably be working on. It would be like, you know, one was this one, one was this one. Right. And so like, I had an understanding of like, okay, I know the areas, but the actual, what we were going to be doing no clue whatsoever right whereas then for my advisor you know she was like for my phd advisor she then was saying hey it just has to be in chocolate and, you know that was what the funding was for because we were making a class that was on cacao and chocolate yeah, i could do pretty much anything that i wanted to do but i had to be the one to come up with everything right and so you know that's where we came up with the idea of the fermentation aspect because it relied on the microbiology that i had all learned in you know masters and everything and then trying to apply it from there. But it also got to a point where it was all on me. If I wanted to change something, I would confirm it with her, but it was all, you know, it was my responsibility. It was my project. It was my research. It was my area, if that makes sense. So, but I've been told, you know, in certain universities and certain departments, you will do rotations. You might not even know who your own advisor is going to be for quite some time as well. Um, you know, this is not for our department again at, at, at UIUC for the food science thing, but there was people that they come in, they, I think they rotate every lab for like three or four months, if I remember correctly, like they go through every month and then they do these rotations for like a semester. And then, you know, they'll pick somebody after that and then vice versa, the uh, advisor will pick somebody and hopefully it's a good match basically. Um, I've heard people that and they come into their and, and they know exactly what their project is going to be working on because it's a master's project and it's much, I would say, easier to be able to kind of, you know, plan out and work on versus like a PhD. I don't think I've ever seen a single person where they're told like what their PhD projects are going to be. I think it's, you know, that as, as it should be in my personal opinion is you have to kind of figure it out yourself because that's the best way to get trained and understand and learn it is to just struggle through it and try to do it, try to, you know, go through every aspect where you're just being kind of pushed in one direction or the other by your advisor, basically. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably the best I can say for all of those. No, it makes sense. I mean, I understand advisor. Now I am, now that I'm on the other side, I do see how the advisor yeah. makes a difference. And mm -hmm. arguably that's make sure you like your advisor when you're signing up for it or yes. i shouldn't say like but you should have a personality a good relationship that, a relationship yeah. and that your work complements each other because some yeah. people really need the structure and all that mm -hmm. and i was 
um, with my personal experience. So I entered in a master's program mm. and I had a project preset. It was like here, this is a, an exchange student had done this project. We want to publish it, replicate it. And then that's mm. your master's project. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to replicate it. <laughs> so over time, but I, during that process, I did transfer over to the PhD mm. and then it became, okay, well now you're just in water based the, um, water and oil emulsions mm. stabilized by fat. That's your general area. Now let's mm. start making projects out of that. So that transformed okay. over time. So kind sure. of to alluding like what you have where it was like, this is where the funding is in this area. Right. But I have heard that um, different advisors are very hands on different ones have different ideas about how you talk and all that. So when it comes to the so once you got into the post COVID and you're working on your project, did you, when, sorry, I have to backtrack. So you're totally good. <laughs> your lab work, did you end up doing any of your lab work at Illinois? Yes, you did. You did. I was listening. <laughs> no, you're so, so you did do some, you did some lab work at Illinois, um, at your university with the T's and such. What did your structure of your day look like? Like what was the, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I think it depends a lot on what um, year uh, of my PhD that you, you okay. know, everything was a little bit different. Like first year PhDs and or masters, you're typically coming in, you're reading some papers, maybe um, you're, you know, setting up groundwork. You're just trying to get used to the lab itself and like pipetting and, you know, streaking plates, if that's your thing or whatever, you know, basic stuff that you're trying to do. Uh, maybe you're just watching a postdoc or a PhD or something else in the matter that's doing their experiments and you're helping out so you can kind of learn the flow, right? Um, then you're going into classes and you're going to do classwork and schoolwork and all this other stuff. And if you're a TA, then you're prepping to, you know, do your own, teach your own class and everything. Um, and so, you know, then it's like you get to your second year and your third years, you know, typically that's when then you're going to be doing less class and more lab work. And then you're doing more so on your own or you're doing more duties. You're having meetings with collaborators or you're talking, you know, you're going and going to this other building to use this one very specific machine or instrument that's only in this building in this one kind of back alley room, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to pick up in, in learning about that stuff or you're reading more papers about how to this person do this thing or what did they work on in this um and then you get to kind of your third and fourth year and that's when you're really you know finishing up data that's when you're really trying to focus on you know making sure that everything is aligned you're doing your statistics you're starting to write it up you're putting your materials your methods all that other stuff together for me it was a little bit different in that like i said like if we ignore the two years of covid and just kind of take that out and throw it away, then that's pretty much kind of what it was like. Um, but uh, I, I taught classes. I loved teaching classes. I also liked taking classes. I thought it was fun because, you know, this is the time to learn something new and to take different areas, not just in food science personally. Like I took integrative biology classes. I took I took statistics classes. I took uh, theater and art production classes. I took a ceramics class. I took a vegetable gardening class because why not, right? That like, is so cool. <laughs> but again, first off, I will say this is all based off your advisor and how much that they... Um, I would say put emphasis onto what the lab work needs to be done. My advisor was very much like, as long as your work is done, it doesn't really matter, right? But you know, there are some advisors that they want to see you in the lab from nine to five or whatever else matter. Um, you know, I had a, a different professor when I told them that I was taking a theater class, they were like, I would never let my student take a theater class. And I was like, okay, well, that's great. I'm not your student, but like, whatever. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, again, it's very much, as we said before, it's so dependent on your advisor as to what their processes are. But I will always say like for you, you are your own person, you know, no matter what it comes down to, as long as at the end of the day, you are doing your work, but you're able to gain a valuable skill by taking a Spanish class or, you know, you're taking cooking 101 because you just have never had a chance to be able to do it. Go for it because this is the time to do it. Because when you, when, you know, you get out, you're now going to be at a nine to five job, most likely, right? You're, you know, dependingly, I think it's the statistics are only like 10% of people go back into academia into like postdoc and all that other, you know, professors and stuff. And so 90% of people, right, are going to go out into industry. They're going to go out into wherever. You're going to have a nine to five job, if not, again, a little bit different. You're not going to have as much time for structured, you know, really good classes in 
taking something at a university, right? Like, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. So this is the best time I think personally to do it, right? You have tuitions typically covered for if you have an RATA or, you know, fellowship or something like that. So take a vegetable gardening class. It's a great way. I honestly cannot say much more to take a de-stressor from everything that relies on grad school. I had multiple people that took yoga or like fitness classes because they wanted a, a workout in the middle of the day, just to stop thinking about, science, 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 science the entire time. And so, you know, take advantage of those things and find what works for you and, you know, have a conversation with your advisor and, and hopefully it works out well. And I think that you point out a good thing about how there's so many opportunities and just the flexibility that you can even do it in the middle of the day. Oh, once yeah. you get a typical job, you might have a lunch break, but yeah. odds are you aren't going to have time to go shoot out and do a pottery class. It's right. just, not within your realm. Nope. <laughs> That's the weekend stuff now. <laughs> that is true. But I mean, some people do. I mean, it is nice, though, to have that structure once yes. you start to work. I When I did do a little bit of time in between my graduate school and undergrad, I did work for a year. And I did like the idea of when I went home, it was my time. And I did yep. not have to, to try okay. to squish something in between. So that was a nice aspect. But then again, being in grad school, the flexibility is nice that you can run out and even it, and also having so many things on campus is such a nice thing. Oh yeah. As well. Yeah. There's events, there's free food, there's networking things. There's, you know, Oh, your friends want to you know, meet up and make a Quidditch club. Sure. Why not? Like there's, you know, what else are you going to be able to do it? Right. Like, you know, Oh, you want to go to a gym and you'll see like, 800 other students there that are all working out as well yeah you'll probably find them there you know there's a pool because there always is a pool right like or there's great there's always good food i will say that's the one thing i do miss about college towns is that it's like everything there's a certain you just go on this strip and everything is going to be good decent food right um and for good prices so you're not paying downtown prices anymore or something like that um yeah i i, I do miss that <laughs> part of college unless, unless you're like me who my college town is a downtown so i'm in mm. i'm in, I'm in toronto mm -hmm. so i'm like right in the heart of it so yeah it's a little <laughs> bit different it's a little bit different for that side yeah um, i go to the grocery store well, it's expensive right now <laughs> just in general but i i digress um one of the things that you had mentioned was that you you taught so you did ta you you acted yes. as a TA. so can you tell a little can you speak a little bit more about that? Like what is being a TA and like, why did you have to do it? I, I just, I loved teaching. I've always loved teaching. Like when I was in high school and, and then when I went into community college and my undergraduate, I uh, signed up as like a tutor or something like that, you know, for, to, it's a good you know, after school job. And I luckily didn't have to work at like fast or something like that. I'm saying this <laughs> in the kindest way. Uh, but I, you know, I worked at like Best Buy and stuff like that. So it was just, it was a, it was a good experience as a tutor, but it was always cool because you can see the way that people would light up when a thought or a, a an idea finally made sense to them that they had been struggling with for so long. Right. Um, you know, the, the lighting up their faces or the way that students kind of interact and everybody always comes at, um, you know, assignments in different ways. And it was never like, you would never get the same assignment turned in, every, you know, every single time, right? I loved also just designing courses and, you know, teaching and, and learning in that aspect of like making workshops or having it be fun because, you know, I would say the majority of the time when I was taking a lecture, you get to a point where their voice is the same, they're talking about boring concepts, they're not really engaging or interacting and you're so tired and worn out from doing literally everything else in college, you need somebody that's going to be that pep in the step. You need something that's going to be different, somebody that's engaging. And I wanted to be that in my class. And so our class was called Food Systems, Cacao and Chocolate. And what we focused on was trying to teach people food science concepts but not at like a super in-depth level. We would go yeah. into certain things, but we would um, try to basically say like, okay, let's talk about nutrition labels. And what does it mean to say, you know, this is one and this is an FDA approved label or, okay, this, you know, why is it that this chocolate bar is not just all brown colors? Why is it that it's purple and white? We'll talk about marketing. We'll talk about end of life cycle. We'll talk about how our food process from, you know, bean to bar, like, what does that mean? And, you know, what does it mean to, 
when you know let's talk about the bad sides of chocolate when it comes to child labor and slave labor and let's talk about aspects that are going to be you know okay how do you read a label like when it says edta on there like what does that mean or if it says tbhq like does that mean this that you have this scary awful you know poor <laughs> and, and 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 no and i kid you not there's always there's always some students that would just be in there that were like I don't want to have that chocolate. It has fillers in it. And I was like, you can't even tell me what a filler is. Like, let's be honest, right? Like, like if you knew what a filler was, you would tell me why it is in there and you would know why it's in there and not just like for reasons, right? And so we go over all of those things. Like, you know, like when it says, oh, this is for preservatives or freshness, like why do we talk about those? Or GMO and non-organic or this one is, you know, pesticide free or something like that. So we teach people um, that, and, and, and we had major from all over the place, computer science, architecture, uh, actuarial sciences, statistics. Uh, we had art majors, like it, it didn't matter necessarily. We only had 40 students. And, and as long as you signed up, like you could take the class and you got to try a bunch of chocolate, which was always great too. Um, it was typically from one to three o'clock. So you got your chocolate and then you could go home and take an afternoon nap basically. Um, <laughs> and it, there was no tests. There was no quizzes. There was no, you know, hard memorization things. It was five group assignments and one individual assignment that they had to do. And we would still get people that complained about that. And it's whatever, you know, it is what it is. But mm -hmm. I just, I, I didn't want people to be sitting there writing down everything that I had in a lecture slide and, you know, trying to memorize, you know, some name from the 1500s that did this cool thing back then. It just, that, that was not the important concept. I wanted them to learn hey, this one says that it's a 72% cacao. What does that mean? This one says that it is, you know, a vanilla bean extracted chocolate. What does that mean? Okay, this one says that it is raw chocolate. What does that mean, right? And we wanted them to learn more about, they could take and go to a food product and go, oh, would you look at that? This one says it has no sodium added. And oh, cool. Like, I know what this means, right? Or like, oh, you know, like when I think of chocolate, you know, I don't, I, I think more about the, the time and the effort and the energy that went into it. So I will not try to waste food as much comparatively because there's somebody in this world that spent years cultivating this product right here. So I will try my best to not, you know, throw it away needlessly or use it improperly and stuff like that. And so that was kind of the aspect behind the class. And I just love doing it. And, and it got to a point where the first year that we did it, you know, it was, it was me and two other professors. And then one professor uh, went to another university. And so it was me and the other professor. And then, you know, we had COVID. And then after COVID, it just became, okay, uh, this is basically my class. Like, my advisor would show up and she was, she would teach the first class. And then I taught everything else after that. And, and, you know, and she was okay with that because she's a department head. She needed to go do the things that were much more important, honestly. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great because it allowed me to develop really amazing speaking skills and also be able to improvise well with students, but also be able to handle responsibilities and, you know, be able to be flexible, but also stern at the same time, right? Um, you know, just being able to learn how to handle like workshops and how to be able to answer questions or knowing and, and saying, hey, I don't know this, I will look it up and I will correct it for the next time or something like that, right? And just being able to, you know, work with students is just, I think it's just such a fun time, honestly. They come up with some crazy stuff. There's always, again, there's, there's students that they will like, I had a student say, oh, I was sick on week two. This is like the end of the year, right? The end of the like the last class. And they're like, I was sick on week two. So I missed this assignment. Can I make it up? And it's like, no, you can't. <laughs> like, like if you told me the day of, or like the week of that, you're like, hey, I'm sick. Like, can I make up the assignment later? I'd be like, yeah, sure. Like, whatever. That's fine. Just get in at some point. You're telling me two days before your grade is due. Like you want to make up this, no, I'm not letting you make up this assignment. Like, so it's just it's 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 fun to handle with those situations you know <laughs> it, it gives you a little bit of a laugh but that is an amazing opportunity that you don't even think about when you're going into grad school you think about you're going to do research and right. I'm going to be learning and I'm going to be becoming a PhD and I'm going to be becoming an expert on a topic but then you don't realize that there might be opportunities for more than just your research and to be able yeah. to teach a class that's amazing 
yeah, I just, I loved it. I thought it was such a fun aspect behind it. And, you know, everybody's a little bit different. Um, I'm just very grateful that my advisor encouraged and promoted the idea of teaching because one, I mean, it was obviously it was her class in the first place. So, so you know, it allows for my funding and everything, but also like there's some advisors that they don't want you to be a TA because it distracts or detracts from your time. Which I get. And, and, and I understand and I get that, but it's, it's, uh, it builds, like, I was talking with my advisor recently after now graduating, I, I was sending her an email. She said that there has been a, um, like a, a, what's it called? Like a, there's not enough TAs basically, like oh. not enough people are signing up for it, even though there's plenty of students because all of their advisors or not all of the advisors, but a lot of the advisors are saying, I don't want you to TA because that's going to distract you from doing your research or working on your thing. Like some of them are like, no, if you TA, like you were not going to be in this lab or you're not going to work on this project or something like that. And it's like, it's hard to work with at that point because the whole point for grad school is to be able to try to do just like with any other, other school opportunity is to just go out there and have fun, figure out something, do your work and do your research at the same time, but gain new skills so that you're not just a, a one note person right? Like nobody out there necessarily just wants somebody that it's like the only thing that you can do is listeria monocytogenes and nothing else, right? Like they want you to be able to do a variety of yeah. different things as well. So. And it's interesting that that's also the case when many, they want, these are led by professors that do the research, but yeah. then you're asking a professor who's never taught to teach and Yep. with no support it's yeah. sounds like it's, a weird circumstance it's it's a weird circumstance and again it it, it happens because you know I, I think it also like personally like i think there's like a four-year cycle if that makes sense like it's like you'll get some people that are really excited into taing and then as you get the most amount of ta like you get them to a point where there's too many tas then it like it goes down right because then they start recruiting people so that there's not a like there's less people that want to teach and then you get not enough TAs and then too many TAs, you know, and it kind of just, I think it just cycles, you know, through and through, but yeah. I know with my school, um, we're actually required that we have to do one per semester mm. except in the summertime. So it's a part of our funding package that you have mm. to TA okay. and it can impact your stipend if you didn't actually take it. So sure. Again, I, I think everybody should at least try it at some point. I think Agreed. if Agreed. you're going into grad school, like it is, you'll realize, you know, for your times when you were sitting there, like being like, oh, this TA is stupid. And this, this doesn't make any sense. This lecture is not, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll see like what, the, what the difference is between yes. one and the other. Like you'll have a little bit of a, an appreciation, I think for it overall. I definitely um, have a big appreciation afterwards that I <laughs> like, I'm actually TAing the course that I did back in my undergrad and I'm seeing like what they didn't know it's, oh now I get why they acted the way mm -hmm. they did or why mm -hmm. they did this and it's like okay I get it <laughs> that was me in like trigonometry I think like when I was doing a tutoring like I I during trig couldn't understand a dang thing and then I get out of it and I have to teach it or teach like pre-calc and I was like oh my god it all makes sense now like it all just just it's just even by me teaching it, it like just connected together in some way that my brain just functioned around it <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that. And um, one thing I did want to ask during this conversation is you mentioned now you're at McCormick and that transition between PhD and industry can be very difficult for a lot of individuals. Yes. Um, some people just struggle a lot. Did you find it was difficult for you to find a job? If, if you mind ask, answering oh, that yeah. question, but um, was it difficult? It, it, it was very difficult. I wanted to, because of how my timeline was looking, I knew that I was going to be finishing up in this, this past summer overall. And so I wanted to try to secure a position um, somewhere before then, basically, right? Because I wanted to make sure like, okay, do I have a chance to go and like visit the place so I can look at apartments and, you know, visit the city and, you know, maybe go interview in person or, or just something to that matter, right? And so from November of 2023, until like late February, I was applying to at least like three jobs a day. I think in total, I applied to 72 different jobs. And this is all with written cover letters, 
you know, specialized resumes, like everything, basically. I didn't copy, like, to be honest, not every single resume was, you know, perfectly slated towards things, but there's things that I would change to emphasize or to switch around and, and make sure that it was kind of, you know, this or that. And it was everything from laboratory manager to application scientist to, you know, scientists, like I said before, principal scientist to senior scientist to uh, R&D director or, you know, something like that, because, Again, for P, you know, like for for an undergrad, in, in my personal opinion, it's very easy to know what your role is. You're either an associate scientist or an assistant scientist, or potentially a scientist, depending on just the company itself. Like if you look at the the this is what you're going to be doing, or this is what your role entails, it's very kind of easy to to understand that, right? Or like the requirements of a bachelor's degree, very simple and easy. But for a PhD and even for masters, in some cases. It, again, as we said before, it's like you're this over here, but if you go over here, it's something different. But if you're here, it's something different. But if you're here, it's something different. And so I applied to like 72 different ones because I was just I was not necessarily sure as to what I wanted to do, if that makes sense as well. Like I, I was happy with doing R&D or applications or science policy or being a manager of a laboratory or just at this point, it was just I wanted to get my foot into the business in general, because while I appreciated the fact that I went from undergrad into master's into PhD, I didn't have the time to do internships. My old, like my undergraduate university was not set up to get internships in the first place. They were not a really good science-based undergraduate university. And so it was really difficult to have those connections and relationships. And so, you know, every single one of them is like, oh, like, what's your business or like, what's your experience? What's your work experience? And it's like grad school, grad school, grad school, grad school, tutoring and Best Buy. Like it's pretty much what I got. Right. Uh, and so it was, you know, it, it was very difficult, but what I was told, at least for this position, um, something that really stood out to them was I had a minor in theater and that I did um, improvisation and I did speech and debate in both high school and in college. And they really liked that because half of my responsibility, quote unquote, half of my responsibility is to work on this um, workshop class through McCormick called Flavor University. And so I will be taking over like a workshop situation where we go to different companies or different locations and we will host a class, quote unquote, called Flavor 101 or Flavor 201. And there's different ones that besides these, mm -hmm. but, you know, the idea is to teach basically a like whole day long workshop to industry based people somewhere between 30 to 50 overall. And it, it could be anything on flavor to spicy foods to they want to do a chocolate thing at some point, basically to, you know, whatever that they, they, they basically want me to, to, to teach, but somebody, the person I had been taking it over from has been doing it for like almost 20 years now, basically. Wow. And so he's like, I'm transitioning to a new role and new responsibilities. You're going to be the one taking that over. And so they cared about my minor, which I didn't think that anybody would, right? Like not to be rude, but I was like, you know, as a major in biochemistry, a minor in theater. And like, I put it on mm. there because like it's there, but that actually apparently was the thing that really stood out to them of saying, hey, he actually has public speaking experience, knowledgeable in improvisation, able to work on the fly, teaching experience, because I did four years of teaching, you know, the chocolate class plus also two for a microbiology class I worked with. And, you know, I did lab and TA in my undergraduate as well. And so they were like, this person has a lot of teaching and lab experience that would be great for what we're wanting, you know, them to do basically. And so in like late February, they offered me to come up and do an interview. I did uh, three different interviews. I did one with the marketing team because the marketing team is kind of the people in charge with helping with the Flavor University that I was talking about before. Uh, I did some with the research and innovation team um, who then became kind of like my lead person that I'm now working under. Uh, and then I did a 45 minute presentation where I could present anything that I wanted to possible as long as it dealt with food science or flavor science or something like that. And then Basically about two weeks later, I got the offer and I accepted like the day after because I was just so excited. So um, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it was it was a great like it was a very awesome and amazing experience. But yeah, it was definitely a very much like a 
went, you know, from one thing straight into the other. And, you know, I was, I'm so appreciative to McCormick and to just everything that they've done for me because they've really made me feel like a, like a recruited person. Like they make me feel very wanted and everybody is super freaking kind and amazing there. Um, but like that was one out of 70. And I will say that like, and not in, this is not against McCormick at all. This is against like other companies. I received so many rejection letters that I'd wake up every single morning and have three rejection emails and, you don't ever know why unfortunately and that and that's always the most you know awful thing you don't know if it's because okay i'm applying for february but i say i'm going to graduate in july you know i'm not going to be ready to to move or make the move until then maybe they need somebody sooner maybe they don't need somebody that says it and they, you know maybe i'm too experienced for this position or maybe i'm too under experienced for this position and it's really difficult to kind of figure out those reasons why. So that's why the biggest thing that you can ever do, and I cannot recommend this enough, is networking. It didn't necessarily, unfortunately, work for me, but every single recruiter or talent acquisition or whatever that I've talked with thereafter was like, no, a lot of it is, you know, they get hundreds of resumes because it's just, you know, so quote unquote easy to apply today because of AI generation and everything else matter that they'll get people that are from different not even anywhere in food science that still apply for the job because they can just click a couple buttons basically. And I know that not to, that's not ever to discourage or delimit because I know how long it takes to apply to those things. Unfortunately, there's people out there that they kind of shortcut that. And so talent people have to look through every single one of those resumes and give about five seconds to each one. And if for some reason the resume just doesn't jump out to them for whatever reason, it's an immediate, you know, off to that, right? Or they have their own AI as like the talent acquisition thing where they're reading through, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to look for keywords or experiences or dates or whatever else matter. And if their AI or their, you know, machine or whatever else matter can't read it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't have the keywords or something stupid, unfortunately, <laughs> in my personal opinion, <laughs> um, you know, it, it basically, you know, really can make a, a very difficult experience for a person. I also had a chance, like I applied in November. I didn't hear back until like, I think I got one in June and I was like, this is a six. Yeah. Like it was like over six months. Cause I, I, okay. So I kept an Excel sheet and I put a date and I said, you know, this has been so many days since I have applied or, you know, I had a communication mm -hmm. or something like that. And it was like, one was like, I think 185 days. It was like the longest that I got to. And I was like, what are we doing here? Right. Like there, there's no point. Um, so it just, it, it can be a very harrowing experience. I'm, it's not going to, I'm I'm not unfortunately trying to sugarcoat it. I wish I could. But the biggest thing I can say is just network and find a job that you think would be right for you and find people on LinkedIn, message a manager, message somebody that in that, whatever that position is that you're applying for, try to, you know, look for that same position, but as a manager or look for operations or VP or something like that and try to connect over LinkedIn or just try to send an email or get some sort of contact to be like, like hey, just in case the portal over here didn't work. Here's my resume. Here's my thing. Here's what, you know, like my experiences, I would love to be able to work with you, blah, 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 blah. And just try the best that you can and, and be specific, but also be kind and just, you know, don't be angry. Don't be mad, but also don't like <laughs> copy paste <laughs> over, no. over and over again. <laughs> That's really good advice, AJ. And thank you for sharing that and just being honest. I, as much as I wish that I could say to everyone as well, like I do agree, network, network, it's always good, it'll help you. But yeah. sometimes you just gotta go through the the hassle of one yeah. after another, after another. Yeah, yeah. Just, it's sometimes just the reality of it, sometimes the timing, it's nothing of it. But I, I just love what your background and the thing that you didn't think would make the difference, it was right. just for like you personal, that could be the thing that makes you stand out. Like you're, right. and it goes to show that you're a whole person, there's more to you than just school there's other right. aspects and that could that's the uniqueness that you bring to a position that's going to be the thing that can allow you to excel so hearing that and hearing about your journey it's it's been good and we're already at the end of our conversation it kind of blew by and there's a lot of more that i would have loved to ask you but um we, we are at the end but um Thank you so much for coming on the show, AJ. I was going to ask you for another piece of advice, but you already, you rounded off the episode without me <laughs> even having to ask that. So I, I don't know, maybe you can plan that. <laughs> but I do actually have one other question, which is yes. if people wanted to ask for advice or find you, where could we find you? 
Um, so feel free to email me. It is aj underscore taylor at mccormick.com. Uh, there's also uh, LinkedIn. If you look up aj taylor and mccormick, I should be the first one that pops up on there. It's my nice shiny face. And I'm happy to help anybody out there. If you ever have any questions, comments, concerns, or you just want to learn more about different experiences, happy to do so. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with AJ and you gained some valuable insights into the world of grad school. And even if you're not looking to go into it, maybe you just learned about what that experience is like and you didn't really know. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a comment or review on anywhere you get this podcast because it really does help us out. As always, thank you everyone so much for listening and I will see you next time.